This is episode 18 of Revelation chapter 7. So Revelation is the one book in the Bible that says, Read me and be blessed. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So let's do a quick recap in, cha in Re Revelation chapter 4. John is caught up into heaven in the spirit, and he sees God on his throne, surrounded by the 24 elders on their thrones, and in front of God's throne stands four living creatures covered all over with eyes front and back and with six wings. The first living creature had a face like a lion, the second like an ox, the third a man, and the fourth like an eagle. In Revelation 5, chapter 5, we went over how in biblical times one could lose the inheritance, their estate, and how a qualified kinsman redeemer could recover it for them. We also learned that through the sin of Adam, we lost our inheritance, our estate, which is living in God's perfect creation. So the title deed to earth is still in the right hand of God, waiting for a worthy kinsman redeemer to recover Eden. And Jesus, who is worthy, takes the scroll, the title deed of creation, from the right hand of God the Father. In Daniel 9, we read about the 70th week of the Great Tribulation, lasting seven years. And Jesus points out that Daniel chapter 9 is, uh, is the key to the entire uh, uh, Great Tribulation. The rapture happens before the 70th week begins, and the 70th week is seven years. So the first three and a half years are false peace with Israel, then the abomination of desolation happens, and the false peace is shattered when the Antichrist sets himself up as God in the third temple. In Revelation chapter 6, we are still with John's vision and are still in heaven with the throne, the elders, and the living creatures still in view. The scene is still the same, but the manifestations have moved earthwards. And Jesus breaks the six seals. Of the seven, he breaks the six of them, which herald the start of convulsions of earth. Before the opening of the seventh seal, there's absolute silence in heaven for about half an hour. So remember, the seals were the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, the souls crying out, the martyrs crying out, and then uh, the upheavals on earth, the physical upheavals like earthquakes and tsunamis, etc., and then silence for half an hour. So that was chapter 6. In all these seals of judgment, the actions go out from heaven and proceed from the enthroned powers on high. So this were the six seals, and this chapter that we're doing, chapter 7 now, is a, a kind of a pause in the action before the seventh seal is opened. So let's get on with chapter 7. After the massive destruction and death of the four horsemen and the execution of the martyrs that refuse the mark of the beast, followed by catastrophic upheavals all over earth, it's as though there's a pause in God's judgment as he first seals the 144,000. The 144,000 is a gift specifically for the children of Israel and not for Gentiles. All the Old Testament prophets were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. The writer of the Apocalypse was a Jew, Daniel and John actually, and all the apostles were Jews. And Jesus came firstly to, for salvation of the Jews. So we recognize that the Jews are a distinct people and God's unchanging covenant with them still has something favorable for them in reserve. When God speaks of the children of Israel, he means people of Jewish blood, the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. God does not mean the Gentiles. The sealed ones are a united group, just as the crowned elders and living ones are each a specific group. The elders and the living ones are already in heaven, whereas the sealed ones are still living on earth. The scales on the eyes of their blind and descendants will now drop. The sealed ones are taken to be Jewish believers, the chosen out of the actual children of Israel. So the 144,000 sealed. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So the four angels are standing ready to execute God's command but are not yet active. They wait. They have already received the power to hurt the earth and the sea and the trees, but they wait. Then I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. I saw another angel. This is Jesus, a Jehovah angel. I love this picture. They're sort of angels in the, uh, you know, uh, wings in the back, but they're not attached to Jesus. He's striding out in front. I think it's a beautiful picture. Anyway, 
verse 3. Do not harm the sea, the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. foreheads. So there's a pause in destruction here between the opening of the sixth seal and before the opening of the seventh seal. And the angels are waiting, and here's all the people. So the servants seal the servants of our God. During this pause, these servants of our God will be sealed with a mark on their foreheads. Revelation 14.5 says, In their mouth was found no guile. Describes these servants of God as those Jews that have lived their lives entirely free from the adulterous and idolatrous defilement of mankind in general. They are not the prayerless and careless, quite the opposite. Rather like Noah, they have come up before the throne of God as without blemish, without sin, being faultless, as having extraordinary spiritual character and godliness. They were those Jews who had correctly interpreted the signs of the times they were living in. They had learned and accepted what God was doing in their day, that Jesus was their Messiah, and what part they would play in his divine purpose. They are the sons and daughters who stand out because they call on the name of the Lord. So this is the ceiling of the 144,000. There's 12,000 from each tribe. And notice that Joseph is in, and Levi is in, and Manasseh is in. And some, they used to, often when they want to make up 12 tribes and they leave out the Levites, the priests, they'll break Joseph into two and give um, Ephraim and Manasseh. But here, there's no tribe of Dan and there's no tribe of Ephraim. They, they're not there. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Notice that these tribes are not named in the order of their birth to the patriarch Jacob and his wives. So they, they listed in this order, but not, that's not the way they were born, because they were born, the first four were Reuben, Simeon, Leda, Levi, and Judah. So they're not listed in the way that they actually um, were born. So uh, like the seven cities that Je Jesus chose to select in chapters 2 and 3, these 12 tribes Jesus chooses to list in his own divine order. Notice that Dan and Ephraim are missing from the list. The Bible often does this. It adds or omits a tribe but still names 12 tribes. For example, Levi was a priestly tribe. So if the Bible omits Levi for any reason, then it splits Joseph into his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, giving 12 tribes again. Now the 10 northern tribes of Israel, which included Dan and Ephraim, went into exile when the Assyrian Empire conquered Israel in 721 BC. So if you know your history, there was the 10 northern tribes and the southern tribe was Judah and Simeon and Benjamin. And the 10 northern tribes were taken by the Assyrian Empire into exile. So the history of Dan is that he and his brothers envied Joseph and his beautiful colored coat and his dreams of kingship where they would all bow down to him. They conspired to deceive their father Jacob by smearing Joseph's coat with the blood of a young goat. So remember that So Dan was one of those, obviously, being one of the 12. And centuries later, during the time of the Exodus, God gave the tribe of Dan special skills in working with metal, stone, and wood to work for Moses building the tabernacle. They were such excellent craftsmen that over time they became sought after. So Dan's um, ensign or banner was the eagle, and in, in the encampments around the, uh, around the tabernacle in the desert, Dan was on the north here. Here's Dan, he was on the north, and his ensign was the eagle again. So he's, he goes way back. And it is believed that before long, the Assyrian invasion, the tribe of Dan had generally separated itself from Israel and had associated instead with the powerful Phoenicians who were excellent boat builders and global seafarers. Later, by intermarrying with the Phoenicians, it meant that eventually the pure essence of the tribe of Dan became lost over the ages. So when they were giving out the land right at the beginning when they first conquered uh, Canaan, this whole area, um, Dan was given land down here someplace um, on the southern uh, edge of, of the northern kingdom. And then they didn't like where they were, so they moved up. They found this town that they liked, and they overran it. They kicked all the, the occupants out, and they took it over. And then here's Tyre. So this area here was the Phoenicians, and they were an incredibly powerful um, a, a group of people, incredibly powerful. Uh, and, and, and Alexander the Great had the hardest time taking them out. Um, so you can see with the Danites being so skilled with wood and, and, and stuff, 
that they would eventually, the Phoenicians would come to them to help them build their boats. And Dan would eventually migrate that way and eventually intermarry. And so the pure essence of the tribe of Dan became lost over the ages. In one chronicle already, way in the Old Testament, Dan is missing from the genealogies. And the prophetess Deborah complains that Dan didn't help with their wars. In Judges, she says, and why did Dan remain on ships? So Danites were such skilled craftsmen that they turned their hands to making idols like a golden calf that they placed in their city. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that idolaters would have their name blotted out. So the, the, the northern kingdom, I'm not exactly sure where it is in this map, but anyway, so they had a golden calf up here and a golden calf down at the bottom of the, of the northern empire uh, kingdom. And so they sort of bracketed the, the ten tribes. And so because of the uh, Deuteronomy, idolaters would have the name blotted out. They were blotted. And of course, the northern kingdom was given to idolatry and worshipping these golden calves that Dan helped make. And so Dan does not make the list of 144,000, and his tribe is not protected during the tribulation. So the history of Ephraim is that he was the second-born son of Joseph, and thus would get a low-born blessing. But God showed Jacob that the tribe of Ephraim would grow to be a powerful military nation. So Jacob gave Ephraim, the second-born son, a better blessing than Manasseh, the firstborn, which offended Joseph. So here you can see he's supposed to put his right hand on Manasseh and his left on Ephraim. And um, Jacob deliberately swapped his hands around. And here's Joseph not happy that the, the, the wrong blessings are going. So yet um, the blessed one Ephraim doesn't make it on the list of the 144,000, whereas Manasseh does make the cut. So why is that? The Assyrians had an infamous policy of mixing their people with all conquered tribes to keep them from organizing a revolt. It was a very effective policy. By co-mingling people, there was less adhesiveness among them and they were easier to control. Ephraim was an extremely warlike tribe so perhaps over time, the Assyrians made a point of assimilating all those from the tribe of Ephraim. And over time, their pure Jewishness was diluted and polluted. Also, when the northern tribes split from Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon in the south, they created two golden calves. Oh, here it is. One in the north territory of Dan and one in the south territory of Ephraim. And together, these two calves bracketed the idolatry of the northern kingdom. And so for their idolatry, Ephraim's name is also blotted out, and they are excluded from the 144,000. Their tribe is not protected during the Great Tribulation. But really it's a mystery. We don't have any definitive proof as to why Dan and Ephraim are omitted from the 144,000. We only have conjecture backed for by biblical scripture. So this is the 12 tribes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, Leah and Rachel, his two wives, and the two maids, and this is them. So Rachel was his favorite. And Joseph and Benjamin were born from uh, Rachel. Uh, she died giving birth to Benjamin. And then Joseph had two sons in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim. So the sealed 144,000. So notice that these tribes, the way they listed, is not listed in the way they were born because the first four was Reuben, the first four born were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah for, uh, to Leah. And so that's actually the order that they were born in. But here we have Judah and Reuben, and then you know they're all over the place. But the word, uh, the, the name of Judah means confession or praise of God. Reuben means viewing the sun, and Gad means a company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the order that they put them in. So the tribe of Dan is missing, as is the tribe of Ephraim, and the tribes of Levi and Joseph are added instead. Dan means judging or the exercise of judicial authority. But these 144,000 are not judges, nor do they become them. Ephraim means increase or growth by multiplication, but 144,000 is a fixed number. Thus, these two names are unsuitable and are replaced by others that simply apply better. So when you read them in this order, confessional praise, viewing the sun, company, blessed, then you get this sort of sentence. Confesses or praises of God, looking upon the sun, a band of blessed ones wrestling with forgetfulness, hearing and obeying the word, cleaving to the reward of a shelter or a home, in addition, sons of the day of God's right hand, forgotten in the extremity of the age, which is the end times. So that's why they were added in that order.
So these sealed ones are those Israelites who accept Jesus as their Messiah and judge, while the rest of their kindred continue in unbelief and rebellion. They are not the church proper because their repentance came too late for that. The rapture has come and gone. The rapture of the Gentiles and Messianic Jews has come and gone. These are a supplemental supplementary body, precious to Christ, but made up after the rapture of the church. John writes that, I heard the number of those who were sealed, and it was exactly 144,000, not one person more or less from each of the 12 tribes. And John heard that 12 times 12,000 were sealed, which 144,000. So this does not mean that only 144,000 Jews are saved. It implies these sealed ones are a particular class of Jews during this time of judgment. So the sealing takes place on earth of people currently alive on earth at that time. This, seal, this is after the rapture. This sealing also takes place before the breaking of the seventh seal. So they've gone through the six seals. They've gone through the four, four um, horsemen of the apocalypse from the martyrs uh, crying out from the altar and the convulsions of earth of the sixth seal. And they've survived all that. <coughs> Sorry. So this is what the ceiling is. So this ceiling involved a visible and distinct mark upon the chosen 144,000, whereby they are easily distinguished. God often does this, sets a visible mark on his people. When Cain killed Abel, God put a visible mark on the flesh of Cain so that he would not be targeted for death. When the angel of death visited Egypt, it ignored the homes that had the physical blood mark on the door. And when Jericho fell, Rahab and her family were saved by the mark of the scarlet rope she hung out of her window. So we can conclude that these 144,000 will have an identifying mark that is clearly visible on their foreheads, and this mark ensures their safety amidst the general destruction. This seal or mark is something divine. Of course it's not that, that's just a picture. Um, it's the seal of the living God, of God Almighty himself, done by the hand of the Jehovah angel Jesus, who carries with him God's divine authority. This seal of God is the Spirit of God, that is, the Holy Ghost and his special gifts. It's amazing. So this seal or mark is something divine. Jesus himself was sealed, marking him for his divine career. John 6 says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. In Ephesians 1, Paul wrote, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So here the God the Father has sealed him, and here we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Paul continues in Ephesians 4, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So this sealing by the Holy Spirit, this Pentecostal baptism of fire from heaven, will be poured out on these 144,000. All the awesome manifestations that Jesus did, and later his apostles also did, will be even more magnified in these last days. The book of Acts tells us that the apostle Peter was so filled with the Holy Spirit that even his shadow could heal. In Acts 5 it says, So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and council, couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And these repeating miraculous events are calmly described in Acts as, and they were all healed. Can you imagine the power of God that you're lying on a, in the road, on your blanket, paralyzed or whatever, and the shadow of Peter falls on you and you get up and run down the road. I mean, what, what a magnificent uh, anointing by the Holy Spirit. So the seal on the foreheads of the 144,000 may mark them as visibly different, but it also showed the world that they operated under God's divine protection. This is an enormous wellspring of favor and security on these 144,000 that are sealed. Remember when, when uh, Satan wanted to uh, hurt Job, and God said, you can do all sorts of things to him, but you're not allowed to take his life. So Satan cannot take the life of somebody or even hurt somebody that God doesn't give him permission to do. And these 144,000 are sealed. So we see that God is not yet done with the Jews. They will remain a distinct people upon earth up to the day of judgment. And before that final day, God will again turn his face toward them and be gracious to them. 
There's a new morn morning coming for them with rays of blessings for the unparalleled preservation of this people, of God's people. So to re reiterate, the Gentiles and or the church is not part of this 144,000. This is God's grace and mercy extended once again to his chosen people. So a multitude from the great tribulation. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. A great multitude, billions of people, all nations, all languages, it says. All nations, tribes, peoples, tongues. Someone said the earth can easily maintain 30 to 40 billion people. So if the Lord delays, then the earth will be filled with so many people, which no one could number, who would end up standing before the throne. Now, this is a different group. They're not the elders, not the living ones, not the angels, not the 144,000 sealed ones. This is a new grouping. These people are in heaven, standing before the throne, holding palm branches. So they are not those people still living on earth and still enduring the tribulation. So these people are crying with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the elders sang a new song, but this group, these palm bearers, cry with a loud voice. They shout and praise God for their redemption. Verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. So the angels form a grand circle around the palm bearers with the throne, the living ones, and the elders all in the center. Who are these palm bearers? Well, let's cover who they are not. They are not the angels that circle the throne. God created angels and angels are not redeemed. They are not the living ones who are associated already with the throne. They are not the elders who sit, but the palm bearers stand. The elders have crowns and thrones while the palm bearers have palms. They are not those of the martyrs that cried out from the altar in heaven under the fifth seal. The living ones and elders came to the throne before the judgment. These come after the judgment begins, after the completion of the sixth seal and before the seventh. They are not the 144,000 sealed ones. These palm bearers are a great multitude which no one could number. And they are also, they are Israelites, whereas these palm bearers are all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. So these people are not the first and highest class of the redeemed. The palm bearers endured the tribulation. They were saved out of the tribulation, not kept, and not kept out of the tribulation. They endured. These palm bearers are already in heaven before the seventh seal is opened. So they endured the six seals, four of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the martyrs, and um, the, the convulsions of earth. Um, but they have, they're not, they out of there before the seventh seal is opened. And most importantly, they are not recognized by John. He's not already encountered them. So the angel, the elder had to say who they were. So verse 12, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So they're singing and they're crying aloud of these seven attributes. Then one of the answers elders saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? So these palm bearers emerged from the end of the sixth seal, which were the four horsemen, etc. They emerged before the seventh seal is revealed. Verse 14. And I said to him, sir, you know, in other words, I don't. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So now this group is identified. They are those that endured the tribulation, refused the mark of the beast, and emerged at the end of the sixth seal. The scripture doesn't say they died for their faith, but they are in heaven. So we can conclude that they were raptured for their stand and belief in Jesus. These are the redeemed out of the tribulation. How? Likely by the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who testified to the world protected by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very busy during the great tribulation. Verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So who are these people? We know who they are not, but who are they really? They were once sinners on earth and ascribed their salvation to God and the Lamb. They were unprepared and were left behind when the rapture of the church took place. They are the millions that were left behind, weeping and gnashing their teeth. 
They were living on earth during the Great Tribulation. These are those are spoken of in Isaiah 26. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So once the, tribula once the rapture happened and they realized they got left behind, they suddenly learn righteousness. They will not inherit the crowns, the thrones, the princedoms of eternity, but they have received salvation. They were sinners once, but are holy now. They are now servants in heaven, serving him day and night in his temple. So verse 16. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. So after the horrors of the tribulation, now they are living in a blaze of glory, standing before the throne of God with smiles of favor beaming down on them from the king of glory. 17. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this is strange, wipe away every tear. So if there's no pain, they're in heaven now. There's no pain, no illness, no lack of food. What are they crying about? Why are there any tears at all? Could they be crying about lost opportunities? Are they realizing that if they had repented earlier, they could have saved one more soul? No matter how, maybe their children, maybe their family members, if they had repented earlier, they could have saved them. No matter how successful your personal mission, there's always the sadness of the one that was lost, especially when it's a loved one like family and children. Notice that this is the pause between the sixth and seventh seal. God uses this pause to seal the 144,000 and to rapture those that, has managed, that went through the horrors of the tribulation and have now emerged saved. So, but we're still waiting for the seventh seal to be opened. So do you know where you will be? This section I took from John Eggers because I thought it was really sweet. In 1969, Denny Zager and Rick Evans recorded a song called In the Year 2525. So partway through the song, the lyrics state, in the year 7510, if God's a coming, he ought to make it by then. Maybe you'll look around him and say, yes, it's time for the judgment day. So the song is not biblical, but it shows that humans wonder about the future and are aware that a judgment day will come. Even rock stars knew that. So Jesus warns us to be ready to prepare because he will come quickly like a thief in the night. In the book of Revelation, Jesus warns us three times. Yet most people don't read this book. I know I never used to. It's too complicated, it's too obtuse, too mysterious, and it's hard to understand. Yet you are warned three times. And you are blessed seven times if you do read it. All these places, God blesses you. So go ahead and read Revelation. If not in your own Bible, then at least watch this complete series of video episodes. So here's your first warning. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. So here we've got a warning and a blessing in one verse. We are warned that Jesus will come quickly, and we are blessed if we read the book and take it to heart. Our second warning, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And again, we are warned to be prepared, and we are told that Christ comes with the reward for those deserving believers. The reward doesn't come later, but is immediate for those already saved. So do you re deserve a reward? What do you think your reward will look like since the Lord promises that he will give according to your work? Revelation 22. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. That's your third warning. Jesus doesn't say I might come or if things work out I'll come, but surely I am coming quickly. This is the final reminder of the sudden return of our Lord Jesus. He could come at any moment. He could come while you're watching this episode. And if Jesus says it, we must believe it, that he's coming quickly. In Acts 16, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. The word doesn't say you might be saved or maybe are or has a slim possibility of, but rather shall be saved. So salvation is settled the moment one believes it. The question is, are you saved? And if you are, do you live your life for the Lord in response to the sacrifice for you on the cross? Remember, saved or unsaved, you are precious to God. So much so that he gave his only begotten son in exchange for your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. John, said, I am, John reports, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So be aware. 
If you think you might miss the rapture, do not be fooled by the feel-good left-behind movies. Gentiles are not the primary focus during the Great Tribulation. Now is the time of the Gentiles, not after the, the rapture. The rapture is to translate the Gentiles off this earth and into glory, get us out of the way before the sorrows begin. By the time of the Great Tribulation, the church is already in heaven and we're watching from the mezzanine level. After the rapture, God extends his grace and mercy to Israel again. So first the church is raptured out way and then God turns his face back to Israel again. And Jesus' first coming was for the Jews, but they rejected him. Now he gives them a second chance to accept him during Daniel's seventh week, the Great Tribulation. And God is entirely focused on saving the Jews during the end of days. It's if as a Gentile you also get saved, well, good for you. But Gentiles are not the focus. So at the end of each session, we can track the meaning of the images we're given. We've been given all of these before. And in chapter 7, he talks about, in 7.12, he talks about the seven attributes where the palm bearers sing about blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, might, uh, power, and might. So we got one new one. So this is where you are. So these were the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse, the martyrs under the altar, the convulsions on earth, and this is the 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 pause that we've had here before the opening of the seventh seal. So this pause was twofold. In order to seal the 144,000 Israelites who are going to be now evangelizing Jews and to redeem the multitude with the palms that managed to come out the other side of the tribulation, saved, um, and now they're in heaven. So they've been raptured. So Revelation's a book. We started with a blessing. We'll end with the same blessing. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So this is the end of episode 18, chapter 7, the pause between the 6th and the 7th seal. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Please follow me on to episode 19, and God bless you. Shalom.